Hello, welcome back to I Got Board Game. Ooh, got board, got board, game. Game. Got board Game. And so today we are here actually with a preview for you of a game that's currently seeking funding on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. uh, which I which I look at a lot. I really enjoy going through Kickstarters, mm -hmm. and I've backed a lot of things. Sure. And today's is pretty exciting, but we'll go through our thoughts on it in this video and see, uh, hopefully, if it is interesting or worth backing or not for you. And Who are so you? <laughs> what? Who are you? Who are you? I am Ben. <laughs> John. Yes, and that is what we're going over in this video, a game on Kickstarter previewing for you. We don't have the game ourselves. We're not at that point receiving copies from publishers, though that would be great someday in the future. Hoping to invite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> any of you who want to do that. But for now, uh, this is based on what we've seen about the game it, by other people who are previewing it on YouTube, other people in the board game industry, and even ourselves looking through the Kickstarter itself, mm -hmm. the, the main page, and even going through the rules briefly to get clarification. Yep. And so the game we will be previewing for you today from on Kickstarter is the new Mad Max. Board Mad game. Max, the board game. Just kidding. It's not actually Mad Max. I don't. I, I wonder if that's an actual board game too. Anyway, yeah, the they might actually game. have one. We'll see. But uh, the actual game is called Radlands. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, cool background. Huh? Found it on Google. <laughs> so. We'll go over onto the Kickstarter page for now, and then we'll scroll through it together in a little bit when we're talking about uh, maybe some of the parts of the rules and how it plays, but then especially our pros and cons, we might want to jump around on that page to show different things. Mm -hmm. But at least on the main Kickstarter page itself, let me share that. So here you go. They're on Kickstarter right now with five days left to go. And so this game is being published by Roxley Games, as you can see down here. And so Roxley Games is actually a uh, pretty big name in the board game industry nowadays, having published and even done Kickstarters for a handful of other games like Steampunk Rally, the Dice Throne series, uh, and Brass. Birmingham and Lancashire uh, and Santorini. Mm -hmm. And so those are all games that uh, I actually, I think I have. <laughs> uh, so at some point, yeah. Huh? Had or have? I think have still. I didn't get rid of one of those yet. <laughs> uh, but no, they're, they're, Roxy Games does amazing production and you'll even see that with this game. Uh, but first to give you an idea of how this game plays and the whole setup and idea behind the game is its theme is this post-apocalyptic wasteland, as you can tell from the art, but it's done in this really kind of neon way. So uh, that, that has a certain look and style to it. And then these are kind of what the components look like. It is a dueling competitive card game. So basically it's a 1v1 card game. And so the game comes with all these cards, which there are different types like people or person type camps and events. Mm -hmm. And then there's also water tokens because in this game, the only resource is water in this wasteland setting. And so water is what you're gonna be getting to then spend on your turn to activate like abilities on people or for other effects like drawing cards and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the way the game sets up is that there is just basically the one big deck of cards with events and people in it and a separate deck of camp cards. And the idea of the game is you're gonna, in the beginning, choose uh, from I think six camp cards that are dealt to you, you're gonna choose three for yourself. And those are basically like your bases. And so the whole idea of the game is you're trying to destroy the other person's three bases and then you win. And so, and then aside from that, there is that I mentioned the big deck of then the rest of the cards, which are 
the people and the events that can happen. And one of the interesting ideas in this game is that there is just that one shared deck of cards. Mm -hmm. And so your players are going to be drawing from that shared deck, getting what's from there to then play and use against the opponent. And then a little more of the details are that, you know, you have your three bases that can provide you abilities mm -hmm. that once you activate them on your turn, but then also determine your starting hand size. So you kind of have to decide, you know, based on your bases, your, uh, your camps, how many cards do you actually want to start with? How many options do you want? Or do you want to start with less options, but maybe stronger abilities? Mm -hmm. And then the general structure of the game is basically there is the events phase first, where you'll uh, move forward any events that were played previously, because events take a certain number of turns to then activate. And then after that, you'll go on to a replenish phase where you'll get your water for the turn. And so water, like I mentioned, is the only resource marked by these tokens. And then the water, what's important about it is that it's also not going to be saved from turn to turn. So you'll get it every turn and then you'll just have that turn to use as much as you want to activate, again, abilities on people or do other actions on your turn. And then the third phase of your turn is basically the action phase where then you can take as many actions as you want in any order, as long as you can pay for it. And so that includes what I've been mentioning, like spending water to activate certain characters' abilities. Uh, I think it spend two water to draw a card, uh, spending water to get a water silo card, which is kind of a, a way to save water between turns. Uh, and trashing cards uh, to get their effect. So a card can either be played in front of one of your camps, creating like a column. And so a camp can have two, up to two people in front of the camp, like defending it. Or you can actually discard uh, a card, I think a person card to then get the immediate effect in the top corner of it. Uh, such as like damaging some another card or maybe drawing a card or stuff like that. And so, yeah, so then the game will just go uh, back and forth until one player defeats the other player's three bases. And uh, I think John will also fill in with stuff that he knows about the rules if I miss any other important details. About yeah, it. and I, I think as you were mentioning, a couple of the things is just yeah as you're discarding like uh as you play through the game like knowing that you you really are only drawing one card per turn so it is it is a lot of kind of manipulating the cards to do things um and then components wise uh i think there i don't think it's a fully unique deck of all the cards being different i think there are repeated cards throughout the deck but there is a lot of variety of cards that exist that can be played so as you're as we're seeing here sharing uh, through the scroll uh, there's the people cards, there's event cards that you can draw through that we're looking at right now, or like a immediate action cards. And then there's also event cards, um, that can happen and, and the events kind of either play like instants or they, they might take some turns to activate and there might be ways to make them activate faster, or just, you just have to wait that many turns until they come. So lo lots of things like that. And then the other thing with the water, uh, as we're at those tokens uh, right here is I think each uh, you, you start with three water each the white ones and then the black ones are what they call temporary water and those are the ones that you can earn through special either playing extra cards discarding or having that water tower that's saved over time and that's really important because there are certain cards that cost more than three water mm. to play and so it is there is a sense of you do need to prepare for playing these really strong cards that are really, really powerful, but you wouldn't be able to play them normally unless you sacrifice some extra cards or extra ac actions to do so. Yeah, and something something I sh should have mentioned in the beginning too was this is being published by Roxy Games, but one of the details in this game being on Kickstarter and getting attention is I think that they mentioned the designer of the game is a former external developer on Magic the Gathering, which for us, we, we, I mean, we don't exactly know what that 
<laughs> that title means, you know, like, because magic is, Magic the Gathering is the big, you know, grandfather of trading card games that is still running strong today, mm -hmm. uh, but really kind of set the standard of how 1v1 card games with resource management and fighting each other play out. Uh, but then to be a e former external developer, it's like, I mean, I would imagine Magic has had a lot of developers over, over its like probably like 30 years of running now. Yeah. So Easy. I don't know how special that is, but it is kind of a way to gain attention, right? Mentioning that the designer has worked on Magic. His name is Daniel Peachnik. So I want to put that out there if that gets your attention at all uh, but then that also is what you know that kind of experience that he's probably bringing into the de design of this game making it play maybe capture a lot of those like intense moments in a game like magic but condensing it down to a smaller kind of game mm -hmm. uh, the other part to know about it is that uh, since this isn't a trading card game uh, there's no random booster packs that you need to buy to keep playing the game. Uh, the way it's being marketed is actually more like a modern board game, card game, where you just buy the base game and you have everything you need to play. And then maybe in the future, they'll do expansions, but uh, at least with this model, it sounds like it's not gonna be a trading card game. It's gonna be maybe an expansion that has set cards that you then just add to whatever cards you had in the base game. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 good to know. Uh, and then as you can see here, the part that I've scrolled to, I just wanna point out some of the interesting uh, production elements of this game. As you can see on the Kickstarter is those water tokens that John mentioned are supposed to be these nice fat and heavy backgammon style discs <laughs> but that's nice right to have really well produced resources that aren't just punch tokens uh and then also what i thought was interesting when sharing with john before the cards are these synth cards which i'm not sure if our recording is capturing this little video clip correctly but the idea is that these cards are some kind of pvc based card stock and so it's supposed to like be super durable and be able to bend and not need card sleeves. And so it's like these plastic cards. So that's also something to know about the production. And then I guess the last thing I would say before we move on is you have this hazmat upgrade version that you can get on Kickstarter. Uh, as you guys can see, maybe you can maybe notice that I am backing this right now because <laughs> I did find it interesting enough and I love Roxley game stuff. So I think they'll do a great job with it. But maybe go, after going on to our pros and cons, John might convince me otherwise. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But then, but what I am actually am debating now is this hazmat upgrade, which is basically uh, upgrading your version of the game to this deluxe edition. Whereas the regular edition, it has all those things we just mentioned, the, all those cards, all the, the water tokens and the, the synth cards, uh, all in this white box that you see. And actually, if I can quickly go to the top, you can even see that it is a, a nice small rectangular box that is actually a magnetic box. So supposed to be very convenient that way too. And so everything just fits inside. So you have everything you need to play. But then the deluxe edition puts all that into a bigger box, just an alternate art box basically, which has the art that John is showing in his background mm -hmm. apparently, or that's what they're showing will be the art on it. It could change still, but that looks nice. And then it's also a bigger box so that it comes with two play mats for both players. And so basically, yeah, if you add 20 bucks to the base amount, you'll upgrade to this deluxe version of Radlands. So that's what you can expect if you want to go that extra step. And we'll kind of go over what we also think about that option and if that's worth it or not. But yeah, you can see the playmat has been upgraded to being stitched. So they are supposed to last longer. And the playmats are functional ones, not just with the artwork, but mm -hmm. have the spots for the cards that you're actually playing and the water that you're getting. 
And so, yeah. And I'll just kind of keep scrolling down a little bit at a time and we'll jump around if there's certain parts we want to get to show off, talk about. They do have the rules here too. If you want to look through it yourself, you can download the PDF and it's really, it's really small. It's just, I think, I think like several pages. Uh, so it's a condensed rule book. And yeah, so with that, uh, yeah, I guess I should clarify the, the base level pledge is 40 USD about com converted from Canadian dollars and then adding about $20 to that to get to the deluxe version, which you would just do separately when you're backing this project. So going on to our pros, at least based on what we've been talking about and seeing on this Kickstarter, what do you think, John? Yeah. So, so kind of jumping off on this, uh, it seems like a really interesting game. Uh, 1v1 games are always an interesting space because given that you're only playing between, you know, one other person, typically you really want the games to be pretty engaging, uh, whether it's a lot of action or a lot of activity or a lot of strategic thinking is usually the way that most games. So think of games like chess think of games like checkers like the base like old school board games but then in the modern world like more and more they've been trying to move away from just these very simplified kind of everyone is equal with the equal number of pieces and an equal kind of setup of your board and you know like there's some slight variation but you still need to keep things fair and balanced in, in some other way so with radlands the way that they do it is pretty unique where the camps when you start the game are the way of kind of distinguishing you from the other player, giving you maybe some competitive advantage in the way that you can activate or use abilities because your camps are going to be unique. Because I believe all of the camps are unique. None of the camps repeat. So all of the camps are going to be different uh, in terms of kind of the how, the, what powers you have and how they interact. Uh, and then the other player is going to have a different set of camps that do something completely different. Um, and then the way that it balances, though, is, as we were saying, uh, you're both drawing from the same deck of cards in, in terms of the future gameplay for the rest of the game. Uh, you, you take from the same pool of deck uh, of cards that have these different player or uh, these different um, uh, characters. I, I forget exactly the word the, for the it. People. Uh, the people, yeah, different people and then the different event cards that can come throughout. So you're both drawing from the same pool and they're mostly unique uh as i mentioned i think there are some there there's a few of these that are repeated like uh people or repeated events but like there's enough of them that you know you'll be seeing a lot of different ones go throughout and the cool thing and and the thing that they market about this is depending on the way that your camps are set up right it could very it could drastically change how you want to play the cards that maybe you have the same hand as the other person somehow, right? Let's, let's just say, but the, the types of cards that you'd wanna play are gonna be completely different than the other player, right? And I think that's the part that's very unique because you know at the end of the day, the most important thing is that you have to destroy the other person's base, right? And that's the most important thing. So there are different things that you can do to try to mitigate that by playing the player, or like playing the, um, the, the people cards in front of your bases so they're not exposed. To, to damage or, or getting damaged or, you know, you focus on, well, I'm going to be super aggressive, right? Like maybe the style is like, I'm just going to try to attack really hard and really fast. So you're playing a lot of event cards that maybe activate immediately or, you know, or, or something like that. Or you're just like, I'm just going to try to blow them up with all these people that I'm able to play out, right? So there's lots of different styles and potential varieties of how you go about destroying the person's base. So yeah, something I do want to point out uh, that I think is kind of clever, even though it's kind of taken from another game, actually, mm -hmm. is the idea with the camps also, mm -hmm. that in Magic and a lot of those earlier trading card games, you know, when you're fighting each other in a card game, mm -hmm. you're basically trying to eliminate the other player by, you know, hitting them enough so they run out of their life points. Yeah. Where then this one having bases being the things that need to be attacked, that is actually something that we've seen in... Uh, Legend of the Five Rings, mm -hmm. which is a living card game uh, by Fantasy Flight, which used that exact idea where, except that game was a living card game. So you're actually, you know, making your deck ahead of time, choosing what bases for your specific deck and play style. And then you'll have 
basically your province is what they're called in that game and the opponent needs to defeat i think three out of the four provinces four five, and they yeah. can come at your stronghold your main base and so it's that kind of idea but simplified to just having three camps right what that also provide abilities but then are the things that need to be destroyed but i think that is a nice small change taking from uh, another modern game so that it, it could be in one way a little more thematic right whereas like i'm not just like some wastelander and you're trying to kill me like i'm a tribe of people and you're yeah. trying to mess up my tribe or my camps mm -hmm. and so just a nice little thematic touch which i think is kind of smart with the camps uh but then also with that is i think a big pro i would want to uh emphasize is the fact that it's not a pre-constructed deck game yeah. right yeah. that it's not it doesn't have that like high barrier of entry where you need to take the time to make your own deck and figure out your strategies with your cards and bring that to play against someone it is definitely more like a board game where you just bring out what the components are and then you can just set up and start playing with whatever you get. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's also nice. It makes it m yeah. these kinds of dueling games more accessible to people. Yeah. And then I was going to say another thing that's really nice about the style of the dueling game is the way that they do the resource management in the game, right? The fact that I think in a lot of these games, typically there's in these kind of dueling 1v1 destroying other players and resource management games there tends to be this requirement of building up your your resource your 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 ability to gain resources so that you can play more cards in the game right so magic the gathering you do it through playing lands uh in some of these other games legend of the five rings i think um you had you had like fate you need like fate to, tokens that you need to accumulate over time and they help you kind of play more cards by destroying mm -hmm. things or playing cards that allow you to get more so on and so forth so a lot of those styles of games and these 1v1 style of games and in, in, in this kind of you know card game style tends to be very much of this can i build a deck that lets me get lots of resources so that i can play my big cards kind of thing but in this game they simplify that at, extremely right they extremely simplify it because you always have three water every turn right like it's you can't change that it doesn't it's not like you can always get four water every turn it's not like you can be reduced down to two water every turn it's always set three water a turn and then there are as we mentioned ways so that you can get a little bit more water temporarily for the turn but it is a temporary upgrade it's not something that you can like again permanently have so that simplifies how you can play the cards a lot and i think the cool thing about that it means that the game's pace feels faster because that means you're able to be playing bigger like the bigger cards pretty regularly right like you never feel like you'll stall in terms of being able to play a card where you're like oh i don't have the resources to play all of the cards in my hand right which some of the other games that that are like that that can happen like magic it is notorious for sometimes being you know mana locked because you never you just happen to shuffle your deck in a way and you don't draw any of your lands so you basically have to forfeit your match because your deck just did not have enough lands for you to pay for the cards or it's like you have a dual colored deck and you can't right or, or other games where you might be stripped of being able to get your resources so i, I think that's a really fun it, it's a nice way to make it simpler but by also both by making it simpler, it also speeds up the game as well, mm. where you don't, it, it's something you don't have to worry about in the sense of like, how am I going to get more resources? But it is something you do have to think strategically. It's a very limited amount of resources. You only have three per turn. So you still have to be pretty strategic about how you use it. It's just not as, you know, not as difficult to say like, oh, I can't play. So am I really playing this game? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I think when I first came across this and uh, learned that, yeah, there's just the one resource of water. Uh, one of the things that came to mind was like, I think it's it's a cool way of doing it because it's thematic again, right? Like kind of this end of the world, like that's all we are using to keep things going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, I think, yeah, what you were getting at to this idea of having this resource is a nice touch compared to maybe games that don't have any resource that's a dueling game, right? Because those then can lend itself to being unbalanced, right? Where like, 
the small card can be played just as easily as a big card, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where then at least in having some kind of resource in this game, it helps even them when designing it to balance it out, right? Like, like yeah, you all get the re same resources every turn. So it's not something that you have to struggle with trying to plan or get lucky about. But then also, you know, the small card will cost less to do what you need it to do versus the big one will cost more. So mm -hmm. that's then a balancing thing. And then also gives you that decision moment, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that is a smart way of going about including resources as a mechanism in this game. Mm -hmm. And then I think other pro I would want to mention is uh, there might be other things that come to me right now, but the one that is on mind is the art that I pointed out to John mm -hmm. uh, before we started recording too. I saw that uh, it's written on this Kickstarter page that one of the artists for this game is Manny Tremblay, mm -hmm. which is the artist for Dice Throne. And I love how Dice Throne looks. And maybe that's part of why this look appealed to me mm -hmm. <laughs> because I don't actually like this theme normally like post-apocalyptic and this kind of like uh, kind of dirty mm -hmm. punk look, <laughs> Mad Max basically. I, I, I don't like that look or that theme, uh, but maybe the way the artist is doing it and especially pairing it with like these neon colors, uh, I think it might make it more appealing mm -hmm. and like have that kind of popping out look to it, a more vibrant look to it. So I think that's that's really cool. Uh, and then, yeah, you can even see it on the play mats, which then I do also want to point out production wise. Uh, I think the having functional play mats is great, mm -hmm. especially with great artwork and following the color scheme and having everything fit in the same box. Uh, that looks really appealing to me, this deluxe upgrade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember even talking to John about it, right? If it's 20 more dollars. Uh, for those of you who don't know, like a play mat, a regular play mat for any kind of board game, a single player's play mat, uh, those usually cost about $20 retail, yeah. uh, maybe $15 like on sale online or something, you know. Uh, so $20 to add a, you know, a deluxe box that fits everything and two play mats, that's like about like a $50 value, yeah. I would say. Like that's a great deal. That's a great deal. Mm -hmm. And that's why I am debating on if I want to go up to yeah. include this deluxe version. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I something I do want to point out, uh, actually, no, I'll, I'll point it out in the cons. I'll point it out in the cons. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say at least, yeah, this looks great. And uh, mm -hmm. just seeing everything fit and have a magnetic box as the default. Uh, and, I, and I actually do really like this deluxe artwork with the contrast and everything. I actually like that more than this punk design on the default box. Yeah. So so that is something that looks really nice about the game, the, the art style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then kind of going a little bit more into like some of the art style is definitely if you think of uh, like video games like uh, Borderlands, mm -hmm. if you think mm -hmm. of, uh, I think it's Far Cry Blood Dragon actually has a very similar aesthetic to this game in terms of like the uh neon punky bandits fighting all of that stuff it's kind of like those two got combined together where you have both of those at once um mm. also thinking of like you know fallout but if fallout was like not as gritty <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, with a lot more of like not quite cyberpunk ish but sort of in a way just at least with the way the coloring is it gives it definitely that that colorful aspect versus just being like everything is crap and everything <laughs> right yeah. this, is, this is definitely more of the like fantastical versions of post-apocalyptic worlds mm. um and then i was gonna say one other going going to gameplay a little bit more another positive pro i think i found to the game as I was seeing is the simplicity of the life of characters. Uh, that's that's exactly what I remembered now too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, is um, it, uh, like the, the, as we were mentioning, there are these people cards and the bases themselves. It's a very simple life system. It's either straight, which means, you know, it's at full life or it's, I, I don't think you can use the word tap because that's a trademark, <laughs> but it's, it's made horizontal, which means yeah, it's ro damaged. Ro rotated or sideways or rotated or sideways. And then, if it's hit while it's in that damaged state or 
or exhausted state, which I don't think I can use exhausted technically either, um, <laughs> then, then it's destroyed. So bases are destroyed that way. The people are destroyed that way. Although the cool thing about people is there is the people when it's face up, when they're the actual characters, but there are ways where you can play the people cards, but they're played face down. So mm -hmm. on their backside of their artwork, which mm -hmm. is the punk side. So basically yeah. it's just a bunch of grunts, punks that just sit there and they can, the punks themselves can only take one hit. Mm -hmm. So they basically, they're, they're meat shields, right? So kind of thinking of the post-apocalyptic, there's tons of bandits that are kind of just like grunts and minions. Like that's the concept of the grunts. But the cool thing about that is when the punk is destroyed. So in most games, if there's this kind of face down aspect of a card, when they're destroyed, they usually go to discard piles in most games. But in this game, if a punk is destroyed, they're not destroyed into the discard. They actually go back on the top of the deck that you draw. Oh, so those cards that. actually can, like they'll come back or they'll be in the rotation still effectively. It's just that they happen to be a meat shield for your particular play. So that was actually a pretty cool mechanic I saw as a part of the game uh, in some okay. of the gameplay reviews that I saw. So it was, uh, so that's a, that's a pretty unique way of going about it. So then it's like, right, like some of the games you can actually, like if you're super into these games and you get super hardcore competitive, you can mill certain cards if you know there happen to come up or you have an idea that there may be strong cards that come up. So then you kind of like force people to not get them. Yeah, mill milling but, is basically forcing people to yeah. discard cards. From like discard or it gets lost in some way, right? Into the discards usually. But this game kind of protects that that situation from happening. At least with the, the as I mentioned, those, you know, the, the punk cards, right? Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like, you know, if you discard a card from your hand to get the special resources, that just goes into the discard because it's a sacrifice you have to make. But yeah, those, those mechanics are cool. And with the life being like rotated, it means that you can't activate the abilities because they're damaged and they're, they're turned. So usually when you have to exhaust or use a character's abilities, sometimes they'll turn and, and it'll force them to be damaged or exhausted. So you can't keep using them. You have to find a way to heal them or find a way to kind of bring back their action mm. in some way, right? To re, to ready. I think the term they use in this game yeah. is ready. Ready. You have to ready them up again. So yeah, and so and then some of these terms John mentioned, he just he he did mention in passing, like oh maybe we can't say these. It's just because they're in the board gaming world. There's a couple of these terms that are very common, but are actually even trademarked. By like, company. Example, tap, <laughs> Magic Gather, which is rotating a card sideways to indicate you know it's activated or used or can't be used. That's trademarked by Magic. But yeah. I mean, we'll still use the term. It just might not be the actual term these people get to use in their rules. Same yeah. with exhausted. That one might be open for people to use still, but definitely that was kind of the replacement word that certain bigger companies use instead of tap, since Magic mm -hmm. trademarked mm -hmm. that. But, but going on, yeah, adding to what you were saying, actually, that's exactly what I was thinking about uh, the hit point system for the people. I think it's really cool, like, because I think uh, part of what it does is it simplifies how much stuff you have to keep track of, right? Like where certain games like uh, Legend of the Five Rings, um, Pokemon, the trading card game, sometimes magic, like you have to keep track of how much damage something is taking from mm -hmm. some kind of conflict, where then this is a real simple system where everything has at most two life and you indicate it by if it got hit once and if it got hit twice and it's gone, right? Uh, so I think that's smart. And then I think on a, from a design perspective too, uh, I, this isn't a new idea, but I do like it in games still when a card has multiple uses, mm -hmm. right? Where you have, like you were saying, you could maybe play a person as they are, or sometimes end up playing the card face down as a punk. So that's already two uses, right? It can count as two different things. And then what I explained earlier, you know, each person has their own ability that you can activate with water, but then also instead of playing them, you could also trash that card, yeah. discarding it to get the effect in the top left immediately. So that's like a third use. Mm -hmm. So it's not a new thing to have cards that have multiple uses, but I still like seeing that. I think that's smart, a smart use of the same component in your game. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so those are the pros that we can think of right now. And so mm -hmm. we will go on to the cons. So this is where John tries to convince me not and you not to back this game. Yeah. 
So the the first one, I'll start with a smaller one. I I said I I noticed that it's a little hard to track the events unless you have the play map. Mm, so mm. what I so I mentioned that because the way that the game is set up when you set up your tableau, as you can see in the picture, I think that Ben is showing right there. Uh, yeah, let me get to the play. Uh, do you want me to get or to you can just scroll up to the top one, whichever one's the best. But basically the way that the, the board setup is, is you have your three bases that are, and you're going to be sitting across from your opponent. You have three bases, base cards that are sitting out. You have the, you have, um, yeah, basically those cards. And then you might have like your water tower that's sitting nearby you um, because that's something you can always pick up at any point during the game. Um, and then that's effectively your components, right? And then you have your water tokens that are close to you. So the way that it works though, is it's actually a grid setup, as you can see here in this picture is you will, you basically have two rows over your bases, which, you know, they, 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 I think they do most of the references by columns, not by rows, but mm -hmm. effectively each column for your base has two slots above it where you can place, uh, the people into goons or or punks or the play or the people cards right and then to the left of your deck at that or to the left of those cards is the events tracker and that's an important place to to put your cards because the events need to move so every time your your events like because all the event cards have a certain amount of kind of triggers before they activate so the way that the rule set it up is that it it moves forward on this event tracker where it sits on the left side. And then when your turn, you know, starts, you move it up to track one. And then you have other abilities that may be able to move it up more until it hits zero. Right. And it's basically the event is moving toward the enemy base and then it activates, or at least the middle zone. So my con to the game, this is a very small con, it's not a big one, is it, it, it can be kind of funky in terms of tracking your event cards because there is no way to really tell unless you're keeping track of where you put the cards, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how you have to keep track of it. But if you haven't played any uh, people cards and your, your, your uh, event card is moving to like the one spot, if you're not really being careful about keeping everything in the grid shape, it might sit in between and they're like, is it a two? Is it at one? I you know so it's a it's a minor gripe most people it's really not going to affect your gameplay because you're probably going to be watching and seeing that but it is like a minor thing to me of like from a design standpoint the way that you're tracking these events is based on positioning of your yeah. cards but there's no way to really track the positioning without a board to actually show it to you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah that that, that that is what I thought of when I was going back to looking at the play mats and then looking at the rules about how events work. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, this makes me then want to get the play mats more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it can be a limitation, which is also interesting because, you know, like design wise, other the way other games have maybe done like a timer for event cards or such is with certain other tokens, right? Like. Yeah. Maybe if it takes this much time, like three time, three turns, you put three of these tokens on it. Each turn at the beginning, you remove one. And once yeah. it's down to none, then it activates. So I get, I mean, they could have done it that way. And I'm guessing it, it might be them trying to keep two, just like, you know, simplicity of just the yes. water tokens. So we're not tracking that way. But then it does mean they have to come up with this other way, which is like a moving on an invisible track, mm -hmm. right? Which does can lead to that kind of issue that you just described so and, and you know there, there there's some other games that have done other ways of doing it where basically you you base off rotations mm -hmm. of the event so maybe if it's like if it's a event three then you rotate it like it starts off rotated to the left right where mm -hmm. the, the top of the card is on the left hand side and then it goes the like two effect is upside down one effect is to the right and then you know and then that's yeah, it like rotate uh, so i mean so there are ways to do it that way i think that might be confusing because other cards get rotated so mm -hmm. you know you wouldn't want to confuse true. it with your other cards that actually take damage that way because events mm -hmm. don't take damage or maybe there are events i think i've only seen events that have a timer up to three maximum mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. potentially the rotation could have been an option but similarly you still have to keep track of your rotation positioning mm -hmm. so it's just a minor thing um but you know you kind of have to keep track of that right however you play the game mm -hmm. so. yeah i think for me like 
when we were, when I was talking with John before recording this, I was like, I haven't really thought about cons. Not saying mm-hmm. like I'm just super with everything in this game, but okay. I just maybe nothing stuck out to me immediately. <laughs> so I might not be sharing as many cons here, but I guess the one that actually comes initially is uh, both what kind of intrigued me uh, of the shared deck idea, where then, you know, one deck, you don't need to make your own deck or bring your own deck or anything, or you don't even need to shuffle two separate decks. You should just shuffle the one deck and that's what both players are drawing from. Mm -hmm. But I am still concerned about that leading to uh, too much chance. Mm -hmm. Uh, because then in that way it makes me wonder like can this game actually capture that idea of me feeling powerful doing what strategy I want to do like you would in a game where you actually did have your own deck or either made your own deck or the game just has certain decks that you choose and play with right Uh, that have certain strategies or will this game still run into an issue with luck where my strategy will have to be based on what cards I happen to draw, yeah. right? And then maybe, and then maybe the cards I'm drawing uh, don't combo well together, right? And that would then just put you at a disadvantage versus maybe your opponent. Mm-hmm. And so that is still kind of a concern because even though they do kind of market this game as like, oh, all these combos and cards comboing together. Nah, I'm I'm wonder if that actually is true, or because the other way they could make that true is like the combos are very similar, or you know, just not very different feeling. Yeah. Then it's kind of like, then the game is boring in that way anyway, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, all everything comes combos, but combos the same way. Yeah. So it's kind of like there's that hesitancy with the idea of a single shared deck in that way. And and I, I I would say that's that was going to be another one of my pretty big cons to the game too is the the feeling of the push or not push your luck the Yu Gi Oh heart of the cards style <laughs> yeah. of what you top deck is what you get right you like the game didn't really have too it didn't seem like there was too many opportunities for really being able to draw different cards or find ways to kind of get out of scenarios or situations with the cards you have. Um, I mean, again, that being said, one of the things that they did market is like all of the cards are supposed to be pretty powerful and pretty strong in the sense of like they all do things that generally should benefit you in a pretty positive way. Um, But there could be a circumstance in which, you know, however the cards are shuffled, you might draw a bunch of event cards that just don't do anything for you. Right. And you're kind of stuck. Right. Because there's a couple of events I know that like wipe the board for people, except for like one people card that they have. But if like, it's the beginning of the game and you draw two of those, that's two cards that you can't, like their effect is completely useless for mm-hmm. you. So it's like, what, are you, what am I supposed to do with that, right? So you, you can kind of run into that circumstance um, in that way. Of course, that also means that likely the other player will not get that card. So maybe you can plan around it. But, you know, it's still one of those things where you, you do get kind of stuck, maybe, with that. Um, and then I was going to say, in that way, I, I will say, wh- I was mentioning while you have a lot of different camps and kind of a unique thing, or like the way it feels is like, yeah, you're kind of this bandit lord of a camp, or at least you're like running this camp to be the alpha. I would actually say that this game kind of suffers a little bit from the feeling of being different than your opponent, right? So like. And maybe this is me being, you know, like being spoiled with a lot of other two player games where there's variations of the types of players you get to play mm-hmm. of like games like um, Exceed mm-hmm. or um, War, uh, War of Indies or Battlecon, right? Mm-hmm. Battlecon or even like the, the asymmetrical two player board games we played like the Fox or like the the Jack and the Giant Beanstalk game. I forget exactly which one. That's yeah, called. Blood of the Englishman. Oh, Blood of the Englishman. That's what it's called. Mm-hmm. Or the um, the Fox game. Fox in the Forest. The Fox in the Forest, right? So all those games, like, they have very unique variations for each player, whether, like, the gameplay remains the same in some of those games, like, or it's, like, you have, like, pretty unique character powers or pretty unique kind of characters to the other player, even if the mechanics might be similar in the game it gives you that variation versus in this game, other than camps being different, 
you're effectively the same, right? There's not a difference between your two players. So, you know, take it as you will. I, I, I maybe put this more as like a neutral, but I see it as a slight negative, just in the sense that it doesn't feel like it would have been too difficult to create like unique characters, right? That like, mm. you know, you get to have a unique, like a maybe a one-time use unique power per game or like an ongoing power, but it's, you know, it's not super strong, but mm. like it maybe does something to help you a little bit, mm. or maybe that's an expansion they're planning in the future. Mm. Who knows? Maybe that that's an op, like they're going to see how this game runs first before they put, you know, thought into developing it that way. But to me, it's like, it could have been done. Right. It doesn't feel like it would have been a far stretch with the nature of the game that they have here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, actually related to that it does make me think of a con of um, again, going back to that shared deck. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is more of a con against like uh, how it could impact your theme in the game where it's like there. I mean, with the people cards, there are like, I think, special people, you know, that like are named and stuff. But obviously it's not separated out, as John was saying, like into, you know, each player's own deck that they have that character. And so I think thematically, if this game, uh, if you expect this game to, you know, maybe go longer or you go through the deck of cards and maybe there's a rule about reshuffling the deck when it's out for people to keep drawing from, like you could have cases where you're getting characters that another character, uh, the other player had previously. Mm. It's like, oh, how does that person work for you now? You know, just a small thematic thing that would kind of break the feel, I would say. Uh, but that's, yeah, just a small thing to add to what you were saying. But then what I do want to mention, the con I was uh, hinting at earlier with the hazmat upgrade or the deluxe version <laughs> and the play mats is that for me, I'm actually always hesitant about play mats for a specific game uh, because uh, especially one that's functional like this, like if it was just the artwork, it might not be worth it in a sense even though it's like nice artwork, it just depends on if you like a playmat with that art. But because it's actually a functional playmat, that's why I'm actually hesitant because then it also makes me think if a game has a functional playmat, it's made with the spots for the way the game is right now. And so if they introduce an expansion later that adds any new rules, the playmat won't account for it, right? Yeah. So a functional playmat either limits the game and how it can develop and grow and include other things, other mechanics, ways of playing, or the playmat that serves you a limited buy a new one. use. <laughs> hmm? You have to buy a new playmat. Yeah, like yeah, one. and that's that's that would be the concern, right? Because I mean, what I've seen more often is when there's a functional playmat, you know, that's not gonna limit what they want to design with their game. That would be a bad way to approach designing their game. Mm -hmm. But what does happen then is if they introduce anything new, you'll have the old play mat, but then, you know, maybe there's a new mechanic that has another deck of cards that then has to just go on your table off of the play mat. So then the play mat doesn't capture everything yeah. that the game entails. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm hesitant about these kind of functional play mats, even though they are helpful, as you also pointed out before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a point of hesitancy for me on that. And then actually related to that, uh, as much as I like the art on the deluxe box, I had mentioned to John before too, of mm -hmm. uh, if I get it, then do I always have to carry around the bigger box? Yeah, exactly. Right, and it's like, but the form factor of having the game, the base game just being small and everything there, that's great, you know? Yeah. But then if I get the deluxe one and I like it that much and I find the play mess that useful, I just always have to carry on the big version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That, I mean, obviously that's unavoidable because adding stuff is going to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. But again, then that comes into consideration. Do I really want these play mats or need them with this game? Yeah. And it is kind of even the concept of like this game being a small game, right? Like the whole point of the development of this game. And it kind of seems like the way that they designed it was to be small, right? It's supposed to be a quick, I can carry this anywhere. It doesn't take a lot of space. It's not a big footprint and I have everything in one spot. Mm. But then if you add this bigger box to it, then it's like, well, now it's not a small game anymore. It's a big game I have to carry around that is relatively, still relatively easily. And again, so it's a minor, a minor con in that way, but it's still like a, hmm kind of defeats the purpose of the design almost, right? 
Because then it's like that all that space that's right there, they could have made a slightly longer box and added character cards or added tokens for tracking the event. I don't know, like whatever you want to think of, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and or I more think, just character cards in general, right? And I think the last small con that I have is that uh, with these, let me go back. Yeah, these synth cards. I thought that was really cool to see that, yeah, they're basically like plastic cards that are really flexible. And I'm hoping that it is some kind of technology that is also like as thin as regular cards, right? Not thicker Mm -hmm. to be plastic and stuff like that. But then what comes to mind also for me is that since they are being marketed as these super flexible cards that don't even need sleeving, right? Which Which I wouldn't then sleeve. There's always that concern though that if I'm playing somewhere and it still gets dirty, like then that card is just dirty. There's no sleeve <laughs> that got dirty, you know, it's that protecting my card. Yeah. So that that's a small thing for me because John knows I <laughs> I sleeve a lot of games and I because to keep it safe, but also keep it like clean and pristine looking, you know. Yep. And so if these white borders on these plastic cards get dirty, well, they're just gonna be dirtied cards since. Mm-hmm you you know there, you told me not to sleep it mm-hmm. but yeah that's just a small thing uh but i think ultimately for me it comes down to I'm, I'm still willing to back it because i do part of me also wants to support roxley games because i mm-hmm. think i love their previous stuff brass birmingham is one of my favorite games and same with dice throne uh and then santorini is such a great abstract game and the theme yeah. is cool and production, the 3D towers. And then even Steampunk Rally is one that I am willing to try again because I really like the theme and art to it. Uh, and so I think I'm willing to still back this for now, despite what we've been saying, but it still comes down to whether I'm willing to go the extra step for the deluxe edition. Mm-hmm. I don't know, John, if you want to weigh in on if you think. Yeah. No, I was, what I was going to say is I I do think that this ultimately is still a solidly made game, right? Like I had some cons. They're not the, they're not huge cons. Like it's, it's more of a be aware of what you're buying though, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just get caught up by the hype factor. Mm -hmm. Like just really understand what this game is about and what you're going to get out of the experience of the game. So just, you know, kind of understanding the replayability, there will be variation, there will be variety. Is it as much as they market it as? Maybe, maybe not, right? Like there, there, it may seem like there's a lot of options, but in reality, maybe there aren't as many as it says. But that would be something that, you know, if you watch other, you know, there, there are a lot of, you know, other, you know, reviewers that have actually played through the game and you can mm-hmm. see them play the game mm-hmm. and you can make some judgments based off of that to see like, if I were to play this game, seeing what they played, does this seem really fun or really interesting for me, right? And then kind of based off of that, right? Um, I know I believe the rule book is out now as well on PDF, right? Mm-hmm. So people can kind of look at it, read through, see if it's self-interested and makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really solid game. Uh, since Ben is backing it, then it's great. Then I don't have to do anything. And I'll just <laughs> play his here. yeah. But um, I, I think it's a, it, it seems like a really solid game. Right. And, you know, it, it is what it is. It's not supposed to be a super complex game. So that's another thing. Right. It is made to be fast 1v1 play. So you don't, you shouldn't be expecting super complicated, com- like strategies like Magic the Gathering or like Legends of the Five Ring or any of the other kind of card game, trading card games or fighting card games and stuff that are out there. Right. So. So yeah, so that is our preview of Radlands. Like we said in the beginning, you can see here too on their Kickstarter page, they have five days to go. They are clearly funded Mm -hmm. with 300,000 of their 20,000-ish goal (laughs) and 6,000 backers. So it's clearly doing well already. It's just more than dependent on if you guys uh, find it interesting enough to join in on that. Mm -hmm. And so if you found this video helpful, interesting, hope you'll share it with your friends, family, people you play board games with. Hope you'll consider subscribing to this channel and following us on Instagram at IGotBoardGame. And until next time, we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Recording. Recording. (laughs)